Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Security Shorts with Scott. As always, super excited to do these. Uh, we're trying to make sure you, the audience, gets really impactful, interesting information in the shortest, uh, most compelling uh, amount of time possible. And to that extent, I'm very excited to welcome Mr. Greg Schaefer. Greg, welcome to the podcast. Happy to be here. Awesome, Greg. Uh, for all those who may have not have run into Greg uh, in your life, Greg is a principal at the VCSO Services Organization, uh, a long history in the security space and doing VCSO work specifically. Uh, and so, Greg, that's what we're going to talk with you about today, the whole world of VCSO. But we always start off uh, with a little bit of a personal anecdote. So uh, how did you get into the business or anything interesting that's happened in the security space since you've been here? So, so long history is a very nice politically correct way of saying older than dirt. I appreciate that very much. <laughs> and I got into um, IT actually around the time when it was still called data processing. I was a student at the University of Buffalo, started as a student assistant in um, uh, late 89 or early 90. I can't remember which. And started as a network technician and then kind of went through the ranks of doing network stuff, network engineer, network director, Probably around, um, it was around 2000 when we brought, put in our first firewall. So really that was the best in uh, this when I was at a university. And then around 06, I realized that I was spending more time blocking folks than getting them to talk. So that's actually when my career flipped it, flipped over to security more so than networking. And I've just been following the um, path ever since. And, and now I do the uh, information security risk management and uh, I just absolutely love it. That's awesome. Uh, my background is very, very identical. Network uh, admin, network uh, training ended up over on the security space and same thing. Once you sort of get in, it's kind of uh, addicting. Uh, so Greg, let's talk VCSO. <clears throat> this is a term that gets thrown around by lots of people all over the industry. When I talk to folks, it, it engenders a, a different type of concept depending on who I'm talking with. So I would love to start with what does VCSO mean to you? Uh, and what is a good definition that we as a community can use to sort of start rationalizing uh, what the VCSO service is? I think it's important to start from the beginning of how this discipline came about because you've had other fractional Cs before, like the the fractional CFO is probably one of the more prominent ones. So you have CMOs and the fractional this and that. Um, the virtual CISO is in essence a fractional CISO, which is more presented virtually. This was prior to COVID, so uh, of course virtual now is what we all do. And what, what made up a virtual CISO, the folks that you saw doing it were folks like myself. We are the ones that had significant experience as a chief information security officer, and we wanted to provide that experience to small and mid-sized businesses. So originally, and when I say originally, we're talking probably about 2015-ish is when the term started to gain some popularity. I've been doing this since 2017. Um, but along the way, more and more people got interested in the virtual CISO space because it can be lucrative if done right. Um, but you'll see that um, you mentioned that there's a lot of terms of VCSOs out there. So there are a lot of different types of VCSOs now uh, with regards to um, you have those that have the risk experience and then you have other types. I think we're going to talk about that a little bit further in just a moment. Yeah. Perfect. I think that's super helpful. I know a lot of people, it's funny because as technicians, we sometimes overcomplicate things. If we all called ourselves fractional CISOs from the get-go, there'd probably be a lot less confusion. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. But, you know, being who we are, we had to come up with some uh, new term. So what do you think the VCSO is not? Well, and going further from what the virtual CISO is on the risk management side, the virtual CISO is there really to help build a, a business's uh, information security program does basically exactly what a CISO would do. So understanding that, then we can pivot to what a VCSO is not um, or should not be, I should say. A VCSO should not be someone 
who is an information technology security director, someone who's focused on solely the technical controls or solely tactical items. And what do I mean by technical controls? Obviously, you're talking about firewall, rule management, SIM monitoring, those sorts of things, all very important things that need to be done. But that's not in the second line risk management space. A virtual CISO also should not be an inside salesperson. And there are some organizations out there that have added the VCSO service as a way to help sell products in, in their MSSP. And as an example of that, if you have uh, a virtual CISO in that space, and, and let me predicate that by stressing that not all instances of MSSPs offering virtual CISO services like this. They can manage the conflict of interest quite effectively, but there are a lot that don't. And what you have is a virtual CISO then that may do a gap analysis for a business that then will be tempted to look more at gaps that the MSSP then has a solution that they can then sell you to solve that gap. And that's a significant issue because it, it gets down to an MS, a, a virtual CISO should not be somebody who's concerned with anything out, outside of second line of defense. In other words, should not be selling products within first line of defense. Um, the final thing that a virtual CISO should not be is somebody who doesn't have risk management experience. Now, it's very popular for folks to take the VCSO tag, slap it on their LinkedIn profile, and call themselves virtual CISOs. That does businesses a disservice because they're not getting the true risk management experience from folks like myself that really the small and mid-sized businesses meet, need. Remember, we're talking about taking the place of a chief information security officer just part-time for SMBs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. There's quite a bit in there that is, is worth highlighting. I think the first thing... Um, and we hear this a lot, which is the focus on the security tooling, right? It's, it's as you say, a security director. Uh, we get it like, well, the VC so should come in here and tell me exactly how to set up my pick your tool of choice, right? So I love the fact that they are really up leveled uh, from that. And I always talk about the focus on programmatics and strategy, right? Is is the second piece in is risk. Uh, we talk about resiliency a lot. Um, and really that's what we're talking about is trying to help rationalize the risk and the resiliency for organizations um, so that they can understand then what they need to flow down from those pieces. Um, and then the third piece I'd love to talk to you about, and you mentioned it briefly, which is the target market. Uh, so who are the people that really benefit the most from fractional uh, CISO services or BCSO services? Well, these are going to be your small and mid-sized businesses that don't, that aren't big enough to to need or afford a, a full-time CISO. So depending upon your salary survey of choice, I like to go with salary.com that the last time that I checked, the total compensation package for your average CISO in the United States is uh, just a little bit south of $300,000 a year. And of course, that depends upon a lot of factors, your vertical, your size, what sort of regulations you're beholden to, your location, all of that stuff. But in general, it's going to be a very expensive. You can't get a a, a, virt a CISO in anywhere for any anything less than six figures, and that's been the case for several years now. So, um, but but also small and mid-sized businesses, they really don't need to have that experience full time because they don't have the complexity, they don't have the teams, they don't have the tools. So, so really, the target would be. Uh, usually, it's 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 it can be anything from startups with just a few people to up to I usually like to say about 300 FTEs about that size. Then the company really is getting to that point where and and it varies, of course, but is getting to that point where they can bring on a a full time CISO. And really, what the virtual CISO then is doing at this point in time is that they're providing almost the same services that a CISO would. And the reason why I say almost is that it's a different world. And I can say this confidently after doing this for seven years now, how you apply information security program building, if you will, to small and mid-sized businesses is different than higher businesses. You, If you take a CISO from one of the large companies and try to make them a VCSO, that's very difficult yeah. because it, it is an art of dealing with small and mid-sized businesses because they can't afford 
all of the tools and all of the people. So you've got to be very smart. That's why I keep on emphasizing risk management. You have to understand that you can't say you have this vulnerability, you need to have this tool to solve the risk. You have to understand the risk and how it integrates with the rest of the business's risks. That's how you become a trusted advisor and the best advisor for the SMB. I love that. We uh, we often talk about you know the Pareto principle, which is how do you get the biggest bang for? How do you solve eighty percent of the problem with twenty percent of the coverage? Right? Because SMBs are sort of constantly in that uh, discussion place. And what we find a lot of times is they're out buying tools and other solutions that are solving a niche problem that they think they have, when it's really most likely probably not the big, the most comprehensive way of solving. Uh, the problem in the easiest manner. So again, this is where somebody like yourself really makes a difference. Well, um, can I add, can I add also, something to that point there just quickly? Yep. It, and that is one of the big problems that we find where you get the SMBs, are, they're, they're picking a tool here, picking a tool here, picking a tool here, and, and they don't know how they integrate together. And gotcha. and so you've got two options. You've got two, two problems that some are overlapping and some have gaps. And yep. they get this, if you'll excuse the pun, a false sense of security. They think they've got a SIM, a firewall, antivirus, and all that. Yep. They're all great. But when you're talking about tools, you really have to have a holistic approach, looking at yep. the entire tool set at first, and then going from there, my opinion. I love it. We talk a lot with customers about this concept of a fence, right? And most every company we see has overlapping pieces of fence with a big gap and then an overlapping piece of fence. And we're like, if you actually hung your solution together, you could actually spend a lot less money and actually have the pieces of the fence actually touching each other and not leaving big holes and then not obviously overspending on the pieces that overlap with each other. Uh, I love that. Um, Greg, as we wrap up here, I guess the final question is, um, like, how do you think, if I'm an SMB customer and I'm 300 employees or 500 employees or what have you, and I'm sort of thinking about VC shows, what are some of the questions I should be asking to try to dial in the right person to, to really help my organization out? But whether you're going with a person or a firm, you need to understand the resource that's going to be assigned to your account. Again, I've talked about experience. Mm -hmm. Look at what they've done in the past beforehand. I'm not as heavy on needing certifications and all that, but look at the experience mm -hmm. for sure. I, I do think that they should be CISSPs. Um, you also want to look at, and this is more of a firm type thing, you don't want to have an instance where you're trading off PCSOs like every other month. And because it takes a long time to become established, to understand. I always tell folks when we first start with them that there's this ramp up period in the beginning. We're learning your as is because we're not going to start mm -hmm. and, and tell you things that you need to change until we know those things that need to be changed, those gaps. Um, they need to look to to ensure that there's a that certain amount of um, flexibility with regards to time, but there's because w we understand that that it's difficult sometimes doing this virtually and getting folks together. The virtual CISO cannot just be reporting into one person at a, at a well they can report into one person, but they need to be talking with a lot of the SMEs there. So there's the scheduling and timing. And as far as the reporting in, this is probably, the, I'm glad I didn't forget this, The one of the most important things, don't, if it, if at all, if you can, if you can avoid it, don't have the virtual CISO reporting directly into IT. This is the same conflict of interest, potential conflict of interest issues that we see with CISOs. Now, again, it can be managed, but we have found it becomes much more effective if we either have like a dotted line or to like a CIO or if we're reporting into another officer, like usually it's a COO or it's a, in some instances if they have a chief risk officer, that's, you see that a lot in banking and in uh, credit unions, then we report in there. Those are really the major components. You, you, you definitely want to make sure too that look at the experience of the firm if you're going against a firm that that they have they can be able to demonstrate that they've done this successfully before. Yeah, I love it. I think the two pieces that I know that I've heard matter, obviously, is the experience. I call it practicality. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times people just drop in a framework and it doesn't really matter. And so that experience with knowing different customers have different needs. And so you work off a consistent set of principles, and but are able to customize that to what they're trying to accomplish. 
understanding where they are because you could have a 500 seat company and they could be in two completely different places when it comes to their security frameworks and programmatics well yeah uh, so and that's I, hugely I, important to understand the company so that you can know which framework that you want to apply to it don't just go in and automatically assume i'm going to do cis 18 or i'm going to do NIST csf because that's what my preference is it needs to align right. to the company what is their preference and, and what do they really need yep love it um well, listen, Greg, I really appreciate the time. Super practical, super useful. Hope the audience really got a lot out of it. How uh, do folks find you? Oh, you can just go out to our website at uh, vcisoservices.com, vcisoservices.com. Uh, hit me up on LinkedIn. Um, you know, so long as you don't try to sell me anything, I usually accept connections. So, um, <laughs> and, uh, and, or you can always email us at info at vcisoservices.com. Perfect. And with that, Greg, thank you very much for joining uh, Security Shorts with Scott. Super practical, super useful, and really appreciate your time. Thank you very much.